The Culture of Narcissism, American Life in an Age of Diminishing Expectations by Christopher Lash Preface, read by J.G. Michael Part 2 Modern bureaucracy has undermined earlier traditions of local action, the revival and extension of which holds out the only hope that a decent society will emerge from the wreckage of capitalism. The inadequacy of solutions dictated from above now forces people to invent solutions from below. Disenchantment with governmental bureaucracies has begun to extend to corporate bureaucracies as well, the real centers of power in contemporary society. In small towns and crowded urban neighborhoods, even in suburbs, men and women have initiated modest experiments in cooperation designed to defend their rights against the corporations and the state. The flight from politics, as it appears to the managerial and political elite, may signify the citizens' growing unwillingness to take part in the political system as a consumer of prefabricated spectacles. It may signify, in other words, not a retreat from politics at all, but the beginnings of a general political revolt. Much could be written about the signs of new life in the United States. This book, however, describes a way of life that is dying, the culture of competitive individualism, which in its decadence has carried the logic of individualism to the extreme of a war of all against all, the pursuit of happiness to the dead end of a narcissistic preoccupation with the self. Strategies of narcissistic survival now present themselves as emancipation from the repressive conditions of the past, thus giving rise to a cultural revolution that reproduces the worst features of the collapsing civilization it claims to criticize. Cultural radicalism has become so fashionable and so pernicious in the support it unwittingly provides for the status quo that any criticism of contemporary society that hopes to get beneath the surface has to criticize, at the same time, much of what currently goes under the name of radicalism. Events have rendered liberationist critiques of modern society hopelessly out of date and much of an earlier Marxist critique as well. Many radicals still direct their indignation against the authoritarian family, repressive sexual morality, literary censorship, the work ethic, and other foundations of bourgeois order that have been weakened or destroyed by advanced capitalism itself. These radicals do not see that the authoritarian personality no longer represents the prototype of the economic man. Economic man himself has given way to the psychological man of our times, the final product of bourgeois individualism. The new narcissist is haunted not by guilt, but by anxiety. He seeks not to inflict his own uncertainties on others, but to find a meaning in life. Liberated from the superstitions of the past, he doubts even the reality of his own existence. Superficially relaxed and tolerant, he finds little use for dogmas of racial and ethnic purity, but at the same time forfeits the security of group loyalties and regards everyone as a rival for the favors conferred by a paternalistic state. His sexual attitudes are permissive rather than puritanical, even though his emancipation from ancient taboos brings him no sexual peace. Fiercely competitive in his demand for approval and acclaim, he distrusts competition because he associates it unconsciously with an unbridled urge to destroy. Hence, he repudiates the competitive ideologies that flourished at an earlier stage of capitalist development and distrusts even their limited expression in sports and games. He extols cooperation and teamwork, 
while harboring deeply antisocial impulses. He praises respect for roles and regulations in the secret belief that they do not apply to himself. Acquisitive in the sense that his cravings have no limits, he does not accumulate goods and provisions against the future in the manner of the acquisitive individualist of 19th century political economy, but demands immediate gratification and lives in a state of restless, perpetually unsatisfied desire. The narcissist has no interest in the future because, in part, he has so little interest in the past. He finds it difficult to internalize happy associations or to create a store of loving memories with which to face the latter part of his life, which under the best of conditions always brings sadness and pain. In a narcissistic society, a society that gives increasing prominence and encouragement to narcissistic traits, the cultural devaluation of the past reflects not only the poverty of the prevailing ideologies, which have lost their grip on reality and abandoned the attempt to master it, but the poverty of the narcissist's inner life. A society that has made nostalgia a marketable commodity on the cultural exchange quickly repudiates the suggestion that life in the past was in any important way better than life today. Having trivialized the past by equating it with outmoded styles of consumption, discarded fashions and attitudes, people today resent anyone who draws on the past in serious discussions of contemporary conditions or attempts to use the past as a standard by which to judge the present. Current critical dogma equates every such reference to the past as itself an expression of nostalgia. As Albert Parr has observed, this kind of reasoning rules out entirely any insights gained and any values arrived at by personal experience, since such experiences are always located in the past, and therefore in the precincts of nostalgia.